um, is Lebo with us? Uh, Prof, good afternoon. Uh, Ms. Lebo, oh, okay. All right, colleagues. Um, thank you. I see Lebo is on. Thank you very much, Lebo. We love those uh, beautiful smiles, the beautiful ladies. You agree with me, or oh, they are thought leaders in our space, and they are all very beautiful ladies. We can um, afford not to listen to the insight that they will share with us today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, by the time is six past three, so we should be able to kick off with the session. Like I've introduced myself, I'll be anchor um, for the session today. I'm Prof. Ambe, um, a professor of supply chain management at UNISA. And today I am sitting on behalf of the host of the supply chain management game changer series on behalf of Dr. Nteta who because of other engagement cannot be here with us. And um, we have an interesting discussion today, which is focusing on gender responsive procurement and transformation in Africa. Um, those of us from South Africa, you would agree that the month of August is very, very special, especially for our women. And we felt that given the, <clears throat> sorry, we felt that given the um, dynamics and the role that women play, you know that the women are the biggest uh, purchasers and they have a lot to play in terms of uh, transformation of the economy. Um, we need to be able to sensitize ourselves as much as we can to be able to get insight on how we can be able to utilize the strong buying power that we have to be able to shape the economy. And therefore, this session which we have in today, and um, just to let you know that uh, as a way of background in terms of our um, discussion today, focusing on gender responsive procurement, that it is worthwhile to note that gender responsive procurement has a transformational impact on the African economy, as I've said, and um, it has resulted because we have not fully utilized it to structural inequalities and discrimination within the African economies. Women entrepreneurs often... Um, Nolia, can you mute? Thank you. Uh, women entrepreneurs often access less capital and fewer resources than their male counterparts. And um, in most... African economies, women are excessively represented in lower tiers of the, of the supply chain, carrying out lower skilled activities. And therefore, um, we are here today and our speakers will be answering three fundamental questions, which is what is the status of gender responsive procurement in the continent? Um, how to create a sustainable gender responsive procurement enabling and ecosystem in African economies. And the last question is, what are the social and economic impact of uh, gender responsive procurement in African economies? So um, within our thought leaders, we have with us um, Lebohan Letualo, uh, who is the CEO of um, same point and championing African women in supply chain, as well as Pamela Steele, the founder and CEO of Pamela Steele Associates, as well as Colette Yende, the strategic sourcing manager guiding strategic sourcing and supply chain issues at uh, Gibella. I wouldn't want to take much of your time to go through their CVs and profiles because you already have them and uh, probably you know them, but for those who do not know them, I will kindly request that you look for their profiles. And just to highlight that in terms of label, some of the highlight that she is the 2008, 2008 um, she was profiled and cited in Financial Mail as one of the top 10 most inspiring women in within state-owned entities. In 2017, she was nominated for nominations of Global Business Leadership Award 
International Conference on Gender and Sustainability, New York 2017. And 2019 received the top um, Pan-African Award as Africa's most influential women in business and government in the sector of manufacturing. In 2019, recognized as one of the 100 global most influential women in supply chain. In 2021, recognized as the one of the top 100 global women in supply chain and uh, nominated number 20. And also she launched and announced the top 100 women in uh, supply chain. Now, in terms of uh, Pamela, like you know, Pamela is the founder and CEO of the Pamela Steel Associate. She have a very, very strong uh, passion to reduce suffering by increasing access to essential medicine in Africa. And uh, as a way of profiling, uh, she's done a lot of beautiful work um, serving as supply chain management specialist and in supply integration at UNICEF, Denmark, humanitarian logistics specialist, uh, United Nations Population Fund, deputy and acting head of global logistics and supply of farm, Great Britain, regional operations manager of farm, regional office for Horn, East and Central Africa, Kenya, regional relief purchaser, international committee of head of the Red Cross in Kenya, uh, procurement and logistics manager, World Vision. And uh, in terms of Colette, she has transformed a lot of um, supply chain stakeholders engagement within um, 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 Gibella, uh, working on the industry giants, uh, such as Gibella, Reconsortium, Balo World Equipment, Transnet, um, Total South Africa, ESCOM, Colette has attained a portfolio of uh, documented success plan in multiple areas of organizational development and delivering on cost savings and profitable business growth, sustainable development of team and cross-functional collaborations on uh, her strength. Uh, from, her from her profiles, you agree that um, we have a leading um, and thought leaders on procurement and supply chain. And we are privileged to have all three here with us. And they are going to kickstart the, the session. And in terms of the order of presentation, we are going to start firstly with Lebo in terms of the status of gender responsive procurement in the continent, how the second by Pamela, how to create um, sustainable gender responsive procurement enabling an ecosystem in African economies, and thirdly on the social and economic impact of gender responsive um, procurement by Colet. But just before we do that, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to bring to you some of the housekeeping rules. I see some of us, we come in, and uh, when we come in, we should <clears throat> try and make sure that <clears throat> we mute ourselves so that we don't... <laughs> The one that just came in now, please. The moment we are um, coming on board, we try and make sure that um, we remain, we are mute ourselves and we remain muted throughout the session. And um, if we have re, um, questions that we're eager you know, to post, we can be able to use the chat platforms. And um, each speaker will have about 20 minutes to talk. And once they are done, and with all the presentations, we afford ample time to be able to engage in the presentations. Um, unfortunately, I've been informed that um, we do not have any formal slides um, in the presentation. I know it's not a norm for ISCA, but uh, sometimes we need to be flexible. I'm sure that um, um, we can be able to follow through the presentation and make sure that we get all the insights so that we can be able to ask relevant questions. I think on that note, we'll give the floor over now to um, Ms. Letualo to kickstart this um, important um, session. Thank you very much and welcome. Um, Prof, thank you and a good afternoon to everyone. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's the 30th of August and for all the ladies that are part of the platform, I still say happy Women's Month. Um, I know this is an exciting time for us and so much 
that we are doing in honoring the women in supply chain, the women that are doing great things out there, the women that are doing a lot in terms of business, having to participate in all the economic sectors. So Pro, um, Pomasa, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this discussion. I think this is a discussion very close to my heart as a supply chain person um, and being in Africa and ensuring that we create access of opportunities um, to the entrepreneurs out there and making a difference in Africa. So I do have a presentation by the way, which is quick, um, just to open up the session for everyone. As Prof has said, um, he said that I, I've been given a task. The question that has been asked to me is, um, is really around gender responsive procurement. So um, I'm hoping that you can all see my presentation. Um, let me quickly review it again. So that is clear. So um, I'm going to be quick. Um, you know, it, it's easy for me to answer a question around and the status of gender responsiveness, what is happening with uh, procuring from women in the industry, in the continent, talking about Africa as well. I can answer right now and say, we are just not making progress. Um, and I can stop with the conversation. And the next conversation that will follow will be, what is it that we are doing about? Um, and for me, it's really now untapping and tackling this issue with yourself to just tell you about gender responsive procurement in the continent. I think most of us with the reading, we have seen that African gender policy debates have been um, at the center of discussion in, um, in most countries on how we mainstream gender in the NEPAD agency and regional economic communities. Um, and we know around um, the African Union gender policy and the Africa free continental trade area in terms of the work that is happening. When I'm talking about this, um, you know, colleagues, um, I'm always fascinated when I have a discussion with supply chain colleagues and say, do you really understand what does that mean in the context of our decision making? Um, the truth is, um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite amazed that um, so a lot, some of the procurement professionals do not understand what it means in terms of responsive procurement. So the question is, what is it? I mean, you talk about women empowerment principles um, that are really around how we enhance applied diversity and how do we contribute to reducing the systematic discrimination um, from the industry perspective, because that's what gender responsive procurement is all about how women have been excluded um, from this system um, of procurement, not being given opportunities. And remember colleagues, women are the highest spenders, by the way, um, in the industry. We are the highest people that are spending money in terms of procurement. Um, by the way, I'm not just saying just in, in, in buying the fancy shoes and so forth, no. I'm talking about proper procurement in the industry. That's where we are. So with gender responsive procurement, it's really around how we redress the balance, how we adopt inclusive procurement practices, and how we buy from gender responsive companies as well. That's what we're talking about um, you know, this, um, this afternoon. Um, and really saying that women need to be included. We need to really enhance supplier diversity and reduce the system um, the systematic discrimination that we have been um, aware of. But I also want to bring this picture as well, because when you talk about economy, we're looking at the opportunities. There's a lot that we can be thinking of um, and really around Africa. We're talking about our continent and we're talking about the continent um, that is, um, you know, um, it, it's growing very fast um, and there's an appetite for foreign investment. We're talking about um, the, 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 the continent that has got 30% of the ex remaining mineral resources. Um, we, we're talking about the industry that speaks of, um, of, of, of reliance in terms of beneficiation, which means that most of us, when we make decisions, we always buy complete components. Um, we kind of beneficiate, we have mines, but all our resources, we give them somewhere out there into China, into Europe, um, and we're not really doing full beneficiation in the process. And talking about resources, um, capacitating our country, um, those are the things that we're talking about. So those two maps, it's just telling you now where we are um, and what we are talking about when we're talking about the resources. Maybe you're asking yourself why I am showing slides like this whilst you're talking about um, you know, uh, 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 transformation and procurement from the, um, from the women. Always remember, it always starts with where the economy is. 
where are the opportunities? Because that shows you in all the countries that we have, what resources exist. And if you understand this map, it tells you also where the opportunities exist. That, that's it. The resources are there, petroleum goes for different, you can go to South Africa, Botswana, you can see the diamond, the petroleum. So the question that we should be asking, if any of you are seated in any of these countries, where are their opportunities in general? That's where the economy is, and we're driving towards the growth of manifestation. We're looking at industrializations in the industry. But having answered that question, I said that women are just not included, period. Um, I think we're still striving around that, and I want my colleagues, um, both um, what is it, Pamela and, and, and Colin, they will be tackling that fully. I just paint a picture this, um, this afternoon around that. Now I'm going to go a deep dive. So most of us, um, and, and this, is, this is the picture around South, South Africa. South Africa is um, driven by the 10 economic sectors, 10 economic sectors. So these are the, um, the sectors that are stimulating the growth um, of, 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 of our country. Um, and these are the sectors that are creating employment and also opportunities for, um, for, 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 for entrepreneurs, but mostly for women. So for you to understand this, it tells you that each and every economic sector, transport sector, for an example, um, contributes 9.5%. Finance 22.3, government, you can see personal services, agriculture, its own mining, manufacturing, and so forth. All of you, you are operating either way within any of these economic sectors, because at the end of the day, we're talking about the GDP. When you procure out there, when we manufacture out there, that's what we contribute to from the supply chain perspective. No. So now talk about it. If you look at this, you should be able to ask yourself in any of this, if transport sector is contributing 9.5%, what percentage of women are already contributing to the transport sector? I can tell you that from the transport sector, because I'm fully involved in that industry, we've got less than 5% of women that are either in the road, rail, maritime, and aviation. My pleasure, that's why we're trying to transform them. So it's, an in, it's, a, it's, it's a sector that needs to transform. And we're talking about a sector like 2018 90 that contributed close to 319 billion in the economy. So what does that tell you? We need to be able to make a decision. If you are out there, you are a sourcing specialist in logistics. Ask yourself that 9.5%, what does it mean for you? From the finance perspective, with the banks and so forth, women need to have the access to that 2239 percent We're talking about agriculture from the farming, being part of the entire value chain, the mining and so forth. So that's exactly what I am talking about. So we need to really start looking at how we look at empowerment and creating opportunities around these economic sectors because they contribute to the GDP. And then I'm participating in the economy of the country. And that economy is in fact these economic sectors. This may not necessarily be structures the same as um, um, on all the other countries, but this is exactly what is driving our, um, our economy. So now we need to be able to say that looking at this sectors as supply chain um, professionals, um, understand the values of all the supply chains from the demand, from the planning, from the procurement. And, and so how do we leverage the access of the women in these economic sectors within your countries? Now, another picture that I want to paint is around Africa free continental trade area. Colleagues, I'm only painting a picture right now. With Africa Free Continental Trade Area, what we are saying that it is a global game changer and an enabler to stimulate in Africa supply chain. So the question is, when you're talking about gender responsive procurement within the AFTA, within the treaty that has been signed, how are we going to enable that? What does it really mean? Because from the AFTA perspective, they are set um, uh, uh, policies, there's a position papers that um, has been put together to say that we want to see women and youth participating in Africa supply chain. I am challenging most of us as supply chain professionals to understand what it means because this conversation, I am seeing myself with entrepreneurs and with few procurement professionals being part of this discussion. If you understand Africa free continental trade area and what it aims to achieve, and we're going to you know, go into it. I know Pamela is going to, 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 to really unpack this further from the policy and what we really want to do. Understand this in terms of 
stimulating your organization, stimulating opportunities, because we can't have such a beautiful, um, um, a, a, you know, free trade area in terms of an ending intra trading, um, where we want to see women participate. I've seen in Ghana, I've seen in Ethiopia, I've seen in South Africa some of these policies that we've put together in terms of supporting women. AFTA is an enabler, as we are talking right now, but something needs to change right now from the African perspective. Now, um, going forward, now um, there are a lot of organizations now. From the um, UN Women, um, USAID, um, donor funding, um, GIZ, and so forth, where they are saying that, listen, this thing that you are talking about with gender responsive procurement, there is no movement. And then um, I will, um, you know, if you look at this document, this document, it really talks about gender equality and women's empowerment. And it talking about how we create that ecosystems around economic empowerment as well, where you have um, a priority four or five, the goal four and five, which is very important around creating this economic system, the economic empowerment around gender responsible procurement. And it's talking about mentorship, it's talking about coaching, it's talking about training, it's talking about having inclusive um, response in terms of our policy as well. However, it also speaks of really saying that when you're talking about um, uh, equality, um, inclusivity, you can't have um, diversity without inclusivity and not having these women becoming part of the decision making at the policy level and also in decision making um, perspective. So this document also highlight what organizations should be doing in terms of collaboration, in terms of empowerment as well for the, um, for the women in the industry. So now, as we prepare now, the question is how are we going to really transform our supply chain? Um, addressing the policy, legal and institutional barriers, very important. Um, look at the barriers to entry as well. Oversubscription of accelerator programs, my goodness, it's august. Um, in August, I don't know how many women organizations I've been seeing really running ESD programs or training programs or empowerment programs for women in the industry. Let me tell you this, if we as procurement um, uh, professionals, supply chain professionals, we are not making proper decisions and we're not creating sustainability because that's where I am. There is no sustainability on our programs. So when we're talking about gender responsive programs, this should be the responsive, the, you know, uh, programs that are creating sustainability for businesses, not a tick box exercise. Let's stop against all this process of having one program after another um, and, and you know, coming to entrepreneurship training and so forth. Where is sustainability? So in response to that question, how are we doing in terms of gender response and procurement? We are just not doing well. There is no sustainability. There's few organizations that are showing that they are doing well. Um, if we had more time, then I would give you all those specific cases, but I'm giving you the feedback because we're working with entrepreneurs from the AWISCA perspective where we want them to understand the supply chains of various economic sectors. So we need to change that perspective and bring that sustainability. So with that, I want to hand over to one of our panel speakers, um, Pamela, so that she can unpack the issue of the policy um, and, and the enablers now. Um, and what we have been doing already in the industry, because so much has been signed off when we're talking about, um, let's include women, um, and there's triple BE, there's all these charters that has been signed off, um, but also you're still seeing that building the technical skills and also access to opportunities in the industry, it's not working. My last example that is very close to my heart, just in closing, is that we ran, for an example, a program that focused on like 300 women um, in the transport sector, look at road rail, maritime and aviation. Technical skills, getting to understand the industry. Now, when you start talking about ways the opportunities from the industry, and they are saying there's no opportunities. So the question is, why are we doing this? How are we doing this? Are we really going to create and run all these um, incubation processes and not giving opportunities? Because that means that we are just not going to achieve what we want in terms of our programs. With that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Lebo. I love it. And uh, you've made a strong case of why women need to be included in the supply chain to ensure that we are having uh, 
uh, uh, uh, procurement responsive approach. Uh, I will take this from uh, another angle where I come from international development and uh, I look at things from the angle of who's doing what uh, in the names of the United Nations and all those uh, big names out there. And then for who? And what is really happening? What's stopping that from happening? What's stopping women from being able to uh, participate in this economy? Uh, we look at that and then see what needs to be done. So again, I'm a researcher. I'm someone who likes to speak with facts. So I would start by saying, you know, that you know, th th there's nothing that is happening. All those are stuck at the policy level. And if anything, if anything is happening, perhaps it's happening at some uh, capital level. I'm sitting today at a subnational level, closer to the rural community um, um, uh, SMEs. None of those have seen that kind of support that we hear about, you know, from the well-wishers. So some facts to guide us. According to World Bank, of the 1 billion who continue to live under the absolute poverty line of US uh, $1 a day, um, out of those women currently owning only 30 to 37% of all small, medium enterprises. The factors behind this gender imbalance in business ownership include one, discrimination against women in the sector, alongside women lacking necessary skills, resources, social capital, and all rights to engage in economic and financial opportunities. Worldwide research recognizes the importance of creating greater supply and demand for women's involvement and control in supply chains through SMEs. And according to IFC, International Finance Corporation, evidence shows that women have a low risk tolerance compared to men and are often better at starting small businesses and saving and repaying microcredit loans. Additionally, when women are financially empowered, they are able to share or reinvent their financial resources into their family or community through education, through health, and through nutrition. Furthermore, when women are business owners, they are more financially independent and better positioned to address inequalities within their uh, own household and community. Therefore, again, according to World Bank, investing in women tends to have wider community benefits alongside a positive impact on a country's development trajectory as a whole. IFC further states that while all SMEs tend to experience similar constraints when accessing economic opportunities, women business owners tend to be more vulnerable than men and women-led SMEs involvement in supply chains are known to struggle against a range of gender-specific financial and non-financial barriers. So what are the challenges that are faced by women then in controlling the supply chain? As we say, women business owners also face gender-specific barriers, which can be heavy burden to bear. Let's look at them. The first is the social and cultural constraints. These gender-specific constraints consist of three key areas of challenges. That includes cultural and societal constraints, lack of education or skills, and restricted access such as legal barriers to financial opportunities as we will see. There are also societal stereotypes. Now the societal stereotypes can, be, can, can lead companies to choose not to work with women or women-owned businesses within these sectors, which are considered not appropriate for women. Social norms. Such norms hold women back from accessing further education or training necessary for employment. Labor, you talked about training. Then gender bias. This leads to gender disparity in the workforce with female workforce often only managed by men. The second issue is the second is the challenge, or I mean the lack of education or even inadequate uh, skills. As you say, not many women have been trained and you're talking of the majority who are in the informal sector who have no way of even getting to know what opportunities have been adver advertised out there, or even if they are advertised, 
cannot understand, uh, cannot be able to interpret them. So as a result, it can be very challenging to achieve the required qualifications necessary for employment or even setting up a business. There's time constraint, also which limits work hours, which can be very detrimental to their career, especially those trying to establish their own businesses. Additionally, women are more likely to miss out on the networking. Remember, most of the deals are done in the evening after work where men are able to meet at the pub and whatever. Where do women meet to be able to discuss about opportunities out there or you know, who can help them with what? These are crucial to starting up a business, hence holding women back from accessing economic and business development opportunities. There are also traditional barriers, greatly, which greatly limit the financial literacy and the ability to properly capitalize on economic opportunities for women, hence holding them back in the business environment. The third one, as one of the challenges, is restricted economic opportunities and legal barriers. Such restrictions expose women to high risk of exploitation by the middle men in their path towards establishing their own business or properties. There's limitation of women to accessing and using financial services, you know, which leave them out from the financial system. Moreover, many women and community-based uh, SMEs are typically low profit investments that have very limited supporting assets and capital that's, that makes it very difficult for them to obtain financial aid and support, particularly from other already established male-dominated organizations. And I can say this for myself, I've been doing business for the last 10 years, getting loans from the banks is, that, is not that easy unless you have a collateral. This impacts both men and women. However, women-led or community-based SMEs tend to be excluded from large-scale company supply chains because they are often not able to accommodate the big scale of required contracts or adhere to the inflexible company procurement systems and strict standards. Some of them are advertised at DevEx. Which woman here in the rural area or even at the uh, subnational level knows anything about DevEx or even have the internet access to be able to know that there's an opportunity there awaiting them to respond, okay? And so in my research, I also did look at what United Nations Capital Development Fund, UNCDF, is doing. UNCDF programs can generally be split into two categories. One is the local development finance and inclusive finance. In relation to women economic development, three projects have relevance. That is access for women's uh, empowerment facility. They also had one uh, of um, shaping inclusive finance transformations, which both fall into the former category and inclusive and equitable local development, which falls into the latter. Again, I need to update my knowledge as to what has been done. Problem is getting up-to-date information, whether there's been any evaluation of any of those uh, initiatives that have been implemented. But I can say that they have some good, um, um, uh, they have interest of women at heart. And then as you showed the UN women, I looked at what they're also saying with regards to the uh, topic of including women in the supply chain. Uh, they set out seven principles and principle five naturally draws our attention due to its discussion of supply chain. A more detailed description states its aims to be one, expand business relationships with women-owned enterprises, including small businesses and women entrepreneurs, support gender-sensitive solutions to credit and lending barriers, ask business partners and peers to respect the company's commitment to advancing equality and inclusion, respect the dignity of women in all marketing and other company materials, and then ensure that company products, services, and facilities are not used for human trafficking. And again, a lot of these things are just sitting up there on the website, fantastic document, great policies, but how are those implemented and what is the assessment? Where is the result that shows what has been done? So how can this 
uh, challenges be solved and by who. I believe that companies have a role to play, company level solutions, government have their part to play. Again, the people who give most of the money on the gender um, mainstreaming or women economic empowerment, that is the UN and wider organizations, need wider NGOs need to really do their part. Government has to foster gender equality and empowerment of women by holding companies accountable for how they contribute to empowering women to be economically sustainable. They need to establish policies and approaches to induce increased conductivity to gender equality within the business environment of their country and then also address legal barriers that affect women from accessing employment or financial services. They also need to have targeted micro loan schemes. You know, you cannot just have one size fits all, but also you cannot expect women who have no, uh, have lacked literacy skills to be able to, 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 to apply for these things. It needs a targeted approach. Lastly, mandatory requirements such as quotas could also be applied and prioritized by the government, particularly for women-owned businesses and their integration into supply chain sectors such as the extractive industry that you talked about. Companies have a role to play. Companies, and I know you focused mostly, mostly on the private sector side, companies should hold themselves accountable for their role and commitment to tackling gender inequality. First, they should collect information and data to fully understand the specific gender context in which they are operating in in order to create their own appropriate aims and prioritize in their approach to gender inequality. In addition to understanding context of, of operation, they should also provide the training that you talked about and networking opportunities that are aimed to foster female entrepreneurship. They need to support the access of women to the required financial resources and also reform internal procurement systems and processes to ensure inclusion of women-owned and led SMEs and being thorough and being deliberate, not to have women, you know, women fronting men uh, by purporting to be women-owned or women-led, and then in the end, it's the men who will benefit. And so UN have a key part to play because they are the ones who have billions. I was reading of USID, having 23 million for next year for gender mainstreaming. And I know there is the Global Impact Initiative funded by um, uh, Melinda Gates and uh, um, uh, Mackenzie Scott. Again, lots of money that is going to come. I was part of the, 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 the team that was um, participating in the presentation of um, uh, proposals that would need to be submitted for these. And I listened to that and I said, this is something that is going to benefit those who already have, those who know how to read and write, who can write proposals. The women at the subnational level and rural community level will not benefit from that. They are those who will be benefiting on their behalf. So UN have a part to play. The Sustainable Development Goals of which Goal 5, which says achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls comes to mind. So UN Women and UN Global Compact, I know they established seven women empowerment principles that I think you alluded to, which provide companies with a clear framework to enable them to understand and challenge the gender gaps with the work, I mean, within the workplace. And then principle uh, five refers to promoting women empowerment within supply chain. And then the, 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 the UNCDF that I referred to earlier, has also developed a global strategy known as participation of women in the economy realized. It's known as power, which aims to address the economic participation and empowerment of women for financial inclusion. The question I ask is how many of the UN organizations patronize women-owned businesses to achieve their own objective their mandate, and where are the data to support this? I can say clearly that it's time they publish this information publicly. 
they should now stand up and be counted. We want to know that because you don't find this data displayed publicly as to how many business actually went to women owned and genuinely women owned and women led organization. Perhaps we should drop out the word led because led can just be someone who's been put there to wear the face of a woman so that they tick the box, but women owned businesses. And I'm saying this because policies alone are not enough. There's need to reinforce these measures and to hold all those with the responsibility like governments and UN and NGOs mandates are to promote women economic empowerment to make sure that they do their job. And so in conclusion, I'm still within my time. In conclusion, I can say that it is evident that UNCDF I had much more detailed analysis and understanding. So UNCDF, through both its joint and standalone efforts, somehow understand the importance of female access to financial services, education, better infrastructure, and social protection law. There is no doubt that its projects are heading in the right direction. However, without sufficient transparency over the project's evaluation and assessments, few lessons can be learned along the way. And although the current visibility of budgets and objectives is commendable from what I saw from their side, this is not enough to, go, you know, to sort of adhere to UN principles of transparency and accountability. And then additionally, it should be noted that although all projects relate to obstacles faced by women in their control of the supply chain itself, is rarely mentioned. Supply chain itself is rarely mentioned if you read even the, 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 the documentation with the global impact and what. If ever in project documentation, whilst indeed these projects will assist women economic empowerment, their fundamentality in female control over the supply chain still fails to be fully recognized. And although not relevant to UNCDF or UN women fails to recognize the importance or knock on effect, there are projects such as health and education, which may not be directly linked to women economic empowerment, but still remains a vital component to supply chain control and ultimate economic empowerment. And so for UN women, because yesterday I was trying to listen to some of the the, 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 thing, uh, the videos they have on their website and reading just in preparation for this uh, webinar, it's equally clear that transparency of project outcomes must be improved, as it is only through such transparency that the success, trends, shortcomings, and potential challenges with a UN Women, women Economic Empowerment Project can be suitably addressed. It is not enough to provide a brief outline of a project, nor um, no accessible list of women economic projects publicly provided. And not only does this negate UN women's principles in relation to transparency, but in extension, the principles of the wider UN community. It is vital that UN women provide detailed analysis of their women economic empowerment projects in order that their handling of supply chain skills can be reviewed much needed and in much needed detail in order to assess their adherence to principle five. Lastly, I will finish off with what Labour started with. Organizations can stand to benefit economic, economically by reducing gender imbalances. One would expect that organizations would invest huge amounts of money and effort to improve their competitive competitiveness and ultimately enhance their effectiveness and efficiencies by promoting women's empowerment in their supply chains with large scale impacts. This is partially true because many large organizations or companies are investing in social projects that benefit women in their respective value chains and are trying to project the image of gender sensitive organization. On the other hand, the reality seen on the ground, mainly in rural areas, tells us a different story. And because when you are, a, you are where I am, as I said, at subnational level, there is nothing to show of any, any beneficiaries of the billions disbursed so far by the well wishers. Rural women are completely left out. 
yet they are the majority in the informal sector. I've tried to go to interview women in the community here, and most of them don't even want to share anything because they say they are tired. People come, get information from them, go write proposals, receive money, but nothing comes back to them. I thank you, and my colleague Colette will take it further, but thank you so much for listening to me. Um, thank you, Pam, and um, thanks to, to Lebu for starting out the conversation today. I think from my side, I'm going to try and wrap up and put together everything that has been said instead of starting a new um, a new subject. And I think in looking at some of the aspects raised by yourself, Pam, and, and, and Lebu, one needs to um, be intentional within the sphere of gender mainstreaming, what actions could lead to a positive change in the social realm and the social economies of our different countries or as in, in the continent. And I think when one looks at um, all these different organizations and institutions that we've been talking about, we need to start interrogating the data that is there to ensure that it presents with us a good gender data analysis of the participation that we are talking about. It gives us a good base of the gaps that we find within these various factors, be it in the industry, be it um, in terms of position in corporates, also be, in, be it in, in terms of women participation in the businesses. And we need to tackle that data and, and, and analyze it. And I think you, you, you spoke a lot about data and facts and the kind of work that you have done, Pam. And that's, that's commendable. And we need to use that data to influence the legislations that these different um, uh, 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 governments um, use when they put legislation so that we, we enable this data for policies and also for, for, for strategies and the approach to which the procedures and processes are built from, and also just the development indicators because eventually everything needs to be monitored, everything needs to be improved so that we know exactly what we are doing. And with that, I believe that the different advocacy efforts then will be built from there because then we have the data, we've got the policies, we've got the procedures, we understand how we've been monitoring the progress and then we can build the advocacy efforts to ensure that even the plans that are built and the budgets um, to which um, we, we, we base those initiatives uh, from are built, uh, are built in. I also want to just um, touch a little bit in what Lebo also spoke about um, earlier. And Lebo spoke about the intentional decision making that we make. Um, as a procurement executive and as a procurement professional over the years, I think in South Africa, We've had different legislations from, from the Court of Good Practice, et cetera, that, that have been evolving. And the evolution of those um, uh, uh, policies has also been influences, influencing how we buy, uh, be it private and the public sector. And I think having worked in both sectors, I have seen the change um, and I've seen the, 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 the heart from the procurement professionals. And most of it, in my experience, and maybe in my career as well, if I look at the procurement uh, field, it's, it's, it's women dominated. And I think more and more in, 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 in calling it women dominated, it's more and more engineers, you know, right? You find engineers there, you are, we're starting to find lawyers within the procurement space, we, we're starting to find, you're no longer only focusing on um, what we call, um, uh, a supply chain professional. So we've got a diverse um, a, a skill set that you, you find in there. And it helps with the way that we respond with these different changes and with these different influences, because you then find someone with an analytical thinking, be it an engineer or it's a financial person, but you also find from a governance perspective, you then would find the lawyers that are participating in the economists as well, that are forward looking at various things in terms of where is the economy um, going? What are the barriers that we were talking about earlier that are influencing how women respond to the opportunities 
that um, are being presented. But on top of that, also what are the exclusions, right? The things that uh, Pam also mentioned earlier that if you find, if you look at the way that men would do the networking after hours and us as women, you have to be thinking about the child, you have to be thinking about the homeworks and because we also build us and we nurture, right? And we do all of those things within the 24 hours. And sometimes there's not enough time um, in a day for us to do that part of networking, unless you can get that time to go play golf. Because I think some of us right now, we, we don't have this thing in our heads that there's something called a men's job or a men's responsibility. I think that equality is being created forcefully as well by, by the economy, um, by the social ills that we are dealing with. And they're currently forcing us to have a, a, a mindset of saying we will break those barriers that are sitting and that have been set for us. And all that has been set for us by the, um, the situations as, we, as, as it were. And there was also another part that was raised about the role of companies that they need to take accountabilities in terms of how they're promoting the gender mainstreaming, how they're promoting um, businesses and how we're incorporating them. And I, I quickly just want to go through a stats that was re released by the engineering um, news on the 9th of March in that currently PEM said we need to measure these things and we need to, we need to understand what they, what they look like to date. So this may be slightly outdated, but um, in Africa, about 219 of all businesses were owned by women in 2021. And that was in comparison to 21.1, uh, which, which had happened in, um, in, in, in March of the previous year in 2020. So we are seeing a, a growing trajectory of these women. And as it were, currently Botswana is the leader globally with about 38.5. Um, of women-owned businesses, followed by Uganda sitting at 38.4, followed by Ghana sitting at 37.2. Um, and with all of this, it actually is saying that there is that drive, there is that hunger for women to say, if Lebo says women are spenders, what does that mean, right? Women are spending from a a, 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 a cautious way, I'm not saying men are not, please don't get me wrong. I'm saying the way that women are driving um, the, 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 the social impact in terms of the, the, the running of their businesses and the inclusivity. And therefore, the role where we're saying companies have to be intentional to make sure that the barriers that have been identified through various medias, through various talks, through this, all these initiatives that every year um, in different spheres, whether it's, um, it's, 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 it's women events, whether it's government events, where we get to participate and talk about the barriers that um, in businesses we are prevented um, to enter. We're slightly seeing a change there um, in different economies of the world. And I think in Africa, we are starting to see that. And I think I'm also just wanting to leverage again to what Pam has been saying. The, the thing that we do in going into communities and, and, and sharing opportunities and not following through um, with the people that are trying to get into those opportunities, but not getting into those opportunities. I think it's important that we add the element of training, that element of feedback, because continuous improvement is important and it is key to giving people that opportunity to say, we started here, there was nothing. Uh, we've come in, two people have benefited, but more are coming in and, 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 and into the um, the, 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 the different uh, participation and the promotion of um, equality and, 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 and intentional affirmative action as well. This opportunities that are being presented must find its way into addressing these imbalances. They must find its way into incorporating and, and previously one used to look at the women that are participating in businesses and more and more in my environment, I'm seeing, which is exciting as well, more women businesses part participating in the actual mainstream. If I, what do I mean by mainstream? Mainstream from where I'm currently at, which is building trains, we have a lot of women that are currently uh, women owned businesses, not even led as Pimos was trying to clarify um, uh, the, the, the difference. In actual, in actual 
supply components of the train. And, and, and I think with that, you see, I just, you see the heart in it. You see the, 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 the collaboration, collaborative approach between these men that are currently uh, supplying and these women that are coming up. And it's quite beautiful to see um, how this transformation agenda is currently being driven from all angles. And when we often have what we call supplier day, it's exciting just to have a look at the different stands in the different store. Um, and you see the, the, the various participation, you look at um, the stats that they are presenting in terms of the types of um, skills training that they are offering to people, the, the rotation. And some of, um, of these women that are starting to own businesses are actually coming from other training programs that we've done. And I think it's, it's important that even as mothers in, 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 and as women in every um, forum that we, 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 we get ourselves into, we need to be intentional even about discussing some of these things, even with our daughters at home, that opportunities are everywhere, right? And I think challenging from a supply chain perspective, challenging this institution, and well done to you, Nisa, because this is a beautiful initiative for me, that it is challenging institutions like ours to say, you must start thinking about these things. But UNISA is also intentional about including supply chain studies in its own um, curriculum, which then enforces and forces the other different faculties to look at. I, I'm an industrial engineer by profession, but I find myself in supply chain. And where I am, it's because of the diverse and the love that I have for the field, right? So I think the influence um, from a supply chain perspective that then we then need to continually drive a participation of women in businesses, both in public and private sector, number one, number two, in sharing um what we call the successes and the lessons learned and ensuring that we've got the principle the, the policies that are um responding to the social ills that we find COVID has had a significant impact and i think we've seen that and we know how it, it has impacted various businesses and therefore the supply chain industry is having to find itself to think out of the box you know, in terms of how do we help and assist all of these businesses to thrive and to survive in this market, which is currently cutthroat as we know it. And I would say this because where I currently am, I am seeing the challenges and, 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 and the efforts that we're trying to make to meet the suppliers halfway. And, it, and as difficult as it is, I am appreciating the efforts back from the suppliers really in terms of saying we do want to participate in this economy. And this is what we can bring on the table. What can you bring and who else can you introduce us to? And I also believe that in all these economies, there's various, um, in all these economies, there's various opportunities that we could do from cooperation and collaboration to ensure that we build in sustainable supply chain that is not only built from a strong women base, but also that is built from a strong supply base, a strong financial base, and a strong support base uh, from these policies, the processes, and all these other things that I referred to earlier in my presentation, and the advocacy efforts as well that, um, need, that need to be built. I think um, I would leave it at, at that prop for now, and we can then start talking with the ladies and answering some of the questions that are coming in the comments that um, our listeners have raised um, to us and also the contributions maybe back to us with regards to the subject at hand. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so, so much. Um, I call it the LPC team. Uh, colleagues, I'm not sure if you um, would agree with me, but like I said at the beginning, um, the uh, one of one of the finest team or finest individuals in terms of procurement and supply chain management that we have, and you have uh, heard and witnessed them speak for yourself, and of course um, they've provided insight into our expectations, but then the onus is upon us now to be able to engage with the team, um, the LPC thought leading team. And um, I've noticed that there are some comments and insights in the chat platform. Uh, but why I 
take time to look at it if there are any comments that anyone in the, within the platform wants to add they can just raise their hand you can just show up your hand so that i can give them the opportunity why I try to go through the comments on the chat. Um, from the chat platform where we're waiting to get um, the show of hands. <clears throat> Oku uh, Luku is saying I'm very interested. Um, I'm happy to be part of this discussion which is very great. We have also greeting from um, Mansaba, uh, from the lecturer for mountains of the Moon University. It's great to have you here. And uh, we look forward to your participation. We have from Sean Scott. Thank you, Pamela. Your point at the end on raw women is critical. When do you think South African countries should start moving from a focus on gender towards a focus on social economic procurement. That is unemployed women, rural women, single mothers, disabled women. Pamela. Thank you very much, Prof. And uh, that sort of uh, links with the question that uh, Sean Scott asks uh, about how do we make sure that uh, we move away from the, uh, the typical language and think of socioeconomic gender mainstreaming. And I say this again, because if we really are to make a difference, then it is going to the, to the bottom of the pyramid uh, and starting from there up. But the whole notion of talking to, you know, there are some, we call them tenderpreneurs, you know, some, you know, experts in um, proposal writing who are scouting for every opportunity that is coming in the name of gender mainstreaming. And they're the ones quick to grab that money and it hardly gets to the people who really need it most. I'll give an example here in Kenya, my country, that uh, the government came up with a program that uh, is to benefit women, youth and uh, disabled people living with disability. And, uh, and, 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 and they're supposed to be the ones getting a percentage of most of the tenders, public tenders that are, are awarded. But, you know, the people who, whenever there's these meetings, and I learned this uh, recently from a, a conference I participated with under, under Kisum, Kenya Institute of Supplies Management, that the people who normally make it for these uh, uh, meetings where these matters are being discussed are those who are arriving in four wheel drive and, 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 and the less disadvantaged, the disadvantaged people uh, are far from it. They don't even get to get this news. And, uh, and, 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 and if they happen to go, then they don't have the financial resources to meet the, 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 the requirement. And so someone else has to take up that order on their behalf and pay them peanuts. So we need to think about that. How do we go to these people directly, but also, Really, if you really want to empower women economically, you don't have to subject them to all these uh, tenders and whatever. I remember the days when I used to do procurement at uh, a deliberate uh, um, plan of building the small, small companies and see how they can grow to, to become the, the, the main suppliers. And that was something that we didn't have to even subject them to this competition. It's something we agreed with the senior leadership that we want to develop the small businesses as well. And therefore we uh, set aside some business that fits them, that they can manage and help them learn and grow in the process, but without subjecting them to compete with the big, um, the big boys and big, big girls. Uh, and then in the rural area, again, you know, community-based initiatives. How do we reach them directly? You know, if funding is coming from UNDP, from anyone else, how, why can't they come straight to the community and do assessment by themselves? I like the program that Oxfam used to have where, you know, they would come straight from Oxford and go to some remote places in my country, is Kisi, is Kisi land here for the soap stones and sources directly from the people who make it instead of going through the, the middlemen. And that enabled 
uh, those um, uh, soap stone makers to grow really, and we're now able to supply internationally. So it's deliberate initiatives like that that are needed. Uh, forget about the too much good English, you know, not all of us went to school, and therefore we need to find a way to support rural women especially. I see women walk with baskets on their head uh, full of avocado and they go to the marketplace, the, someone takes it up and will go and sell it somewhere else at a much higher price and give this woman some peanuts and she ends up collecting some cooking oil with it and salt and goes back home. But to grow that um, uh, avocado or even um, whatever fruits or, or, or grains uh, that they bring to the market takes them such a long time to till the land and really nurture that um, 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 to, to, to a harvesting or rather to a harvestable uh, product. And yet they end up with peanut. How do we change the equation? How do we make those rural women access the value chain, access the trade lanes? How do we make them uh, remove the middlemen along the way? The women fish, uh, fish mongers, those who spend life in the water every day to get fish from the, from the lake and end up with their fish rotting uh, at the end of the day because there is no market for them. How do we help them? Those for me are the critical things that we need to look at. Forget about these, oh, we advertise the tender and whatever because we are complying with our policies. No, if you have a plan to help women uh, um, um, uh, in the, you know, access the ladder, there has to be a deliberate approach, not the traditional approach. Those are the things that I'm talking about. And how do we also make sure there are people working with these women, even if it's applying for those tenders, whatever, if that is the way an organization has set itself um, uh, as their model? How do we plant women, I mean, who have education, who know how to write proposals to intercede on the behalf of these uh, uh, women at the rural level? I'll stop there and get others to comment. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Pamela. Indeed, you have articulated very well, and uh, it covers the scope of what I indeed wanted to ask you when you indicated clearly that um, most of the um, emphasis around women responsive uh, procurement are uh, on paper. Indeed, you went further by articulating um, some of the challenges you know, you mentioned about education, um, um, those traditional barriers, you know, issues of loan and the rest. And the question that was um, coming up in my mind was that, um, how could we bridge this? But you have already trying to articulate and still probably hanging up with another question to say, we need to, we need to. Probably the next question for somebody who is here will be to say, will, will be that, whose role is it? Uh, most of the policy makers have left it in terms of uh, the paper. Now we have the perspective on how we see it, that it can happen. How then do we bridge that gap to make sure that it becomes practical from the different um, uh, spheres and industry that we exist? While you're pondering on that, I just want to indicate that we have a couple of um, engagements between um, uh, Sean and Pamela in the chat room. So you could be able to focus on, and uh, probably if Pamela, you want to just engage uh, briefly on that in terms of uh, um, your engagement. I know colleagues are seeing them, um, that would be fine. But how do you bridge that gap in terms of the, theory, the, the theories or the policies that exist, the knowledge mindsets that we have to ensure that it becomes um, practical. It, it, in fact, it becomes that, it, that we, we're creating an impact, you know, so that it should not be that we keep talking about this. We know them that the potential of women to make a difference, you know, in terms of the economy. How do we try, especially in those rural women, an example that you try to give in Kenya? Thank you very much. Thank you again, and uh, I will uh, let others also um, chip in. But uh, as you've said, I think for me, um, the problem is, is deeper than we think. Um, I'm saying this because when you think of, uh, you know, the people who keep the, the economy running or even the food chain running are women who toil the land for, for days, for, for, for months in order to get the harvest out there. And yet, uh, they are not thought of. 
I mean, uh, there are many who get to hear about initiative coming. You know, as I said earlier, there's so much, there's so much money that is uh, already lined up. I think this year alone, there's some 100 million that uh, co-impact is supposed to be releasing. And uh, you will find that it's the smartest people who will be getting this and there's very little to show uh, when it comes to results. So what I'm saying here is again, it's starting with the same organizations that give the money. Uh, who is it that they give the money to? And what is the expectation uh, um, uh, of those who receive the, I mean, what's, the, what's expected of those who receive the money? Where does it go? How do we follow that? to the penny and make sure that we have people, human beings who can stand and be counted to say, this is what we did. Not, not those who have been uh, picked up to do some good dancing and place the, the donor, you know, because they've been paid some little money to say that they are the beneficiary. These are things that happen. I mean, I have been in this field for so many years where women can go and be paid money to just go and dance to the donor when they come to evaluate a project to say how much they have benefited and then dance and praise the, the, the donor as if, uh, you know, that's their God. But they will not have benefited in the way that the program was designed. For me, it's transparency. It's public, publishing what has been uh, going on if, uh, uh, UNDP, U, 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 UN women says that they have been giving money to these countries, um, this community, that needs to be transparently displayed for everyone to see. And then lessons that have been learned from there. Without that transparency, we will not know because let me tell you that uh, our governments, I mean, uh, across the continent uh, struggle to find even resources for healthcare, although they could do better because there's a lot of money for for, for, for defense, um, but the donors have so much money, so much money out there, but it will, very little will get to the people who really need it. Uh, when I read the statistics, I've just completed a study right now on youth um, unemployment. That is really, really concerning. Of what's, it's a time bomb. I don't know about South Africa because I have statistics for South Africa also. That's a time bomb. And then you have women who are disillusioned, who have given up because there's no one for them. I let others check in, but I really feel very frustrated with all these topics because uh, um, unless people can um, be honest enough to say that uh, things have gone wrong, uh, but instead of keeping on sending the same money to the same same wrong channels, then there's very little yeah. that we will be able to see. Thank you. Thank you. I see Lebo is up. Uh, Lebo, before you just comment on that, I also like you to just when you reflect on that, uh, also with Sean saying. We must recognize that our countries have a powerful politicians that are not always ethical. If we focus just on gender, we risk meeting the target and having only a few and having only a few very wealthy women. So in terms of that practical and looking at the comment from Sean, what is your take on that? Thank you. Prof, um, thank you for that. Um, I, I will tap on what um, Pamela was um, talking about, but let me quickly just discuss with um, the, an element from Sean's side. Um, I do agree. I mean, if you look at um, South Africa uh, and just across Africa, women entrepreneurs in Africa had to overcome um, various legal and regulatory aspects um, to create new business opportunities. But the big monster that we have is corruption in Africa. So um, one of the studies that has been done, um, you know, by by um, by Comesa's um, secretariat, was really looking at um, corruption as one of the disablers um, of um, business opportunities for women in the industry. So we need to tackle that. Um, Africa as a whole, South Africa as it is. Um, I think from the South African perspective, uh, that voice of anti-corruption um, behavior, it's one of the things that we need to really push beyond if you also want to push this narrative, because a couple of narratives have to be really pushed from procurement. There's a policy side, the framework, there's preferential um, policy, there's also the charters as well. And um, for an example, if you look at the mine charter, that will really stipulate in terms of what companies um, must prescribe to um, as well, which at least drive a certain behavior. But at the end of the day, um, corruption still exists. There's always a corrupter and a corruptee um, colleagues in the industry. So um, I agree with Sean, um, we have to focus 
um, on the um, the policies, the regulatory aspects. I think you have seen all of you that from the Zonda report, what the recommendations has been um, in terms of the implementation. Um, so women are subjected um, to, 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 to corruption. They are subjected as well to discrimination, they are subjected um, as well to um, certain favors to be able to, to get opportunities in the industry. If they don't succumb to that, unfortunately, they do not get um, opportunities. I have seen that. We have dealt with women that, um, that have been succumbing to that. So it's a bigger monster that we as a profession, um, we have to deal with from the professionalism perspective. So um, yeah, that's my response um, from, the sh from Sean's side. Now, taken back to what um, Pamela was saying, with regards to the rural areas, colleagues, we must remember that under the AFTA, um, the Africa Free Continental Trade Area, women in the informal cross trade area, um, um, they said that they will have uh, more opportunities due to the um, tariff reductions um, that are really provisioned for on the protocol of, 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 of trade um, in goods um, um, from the Africa perspective. So um, I'm not sure if any of you have seen the, the AFTAS protocol on rules of origin, because they are out there, by the way. So as procurement professionals, you need to know about that. But it really permits access um, to, um, to cheaper raw materials um, for women. And we preferential regimes as well for women to be able to increase their revenues as well in the industry and to better position them um, to participate in the industry, which means that us as procurement professional, if you're looking for um, proper products um, that are reasonably priced, that already on the value chain will really have a bigger impact. Um, after doesn't speak to South Africa, only it's Africa across the board. So if you look at um, a study as well that was commissioned by the UN Women um, East and Southern Africa, um, SRO. Um, what they had um, indicated was that um, they identified a couple of opportunities for women. And um, what they had also identified was the issue of the cross-border trading, um, the value chains and looking at public procurement as well, and made a provision as well, as well saying that if we have to really allow trade liberalization, which specific commodities should we be focusing on from the Africa perspective, for an example, on agriculture, um, for an example, in terms of agro processing as well, education as well. So um, uh, uh, all of those really matters because they are closer to the rural areas. Are there challenges to that? Yes. Um, and those challenges speak to, for an example, technology. We are moving in the world of technology. So if now we want to support women in the rural areas, the question is what kind of programs really have to fit into a rural space um, perspective. What I am more comfortable around, um, which the questions that um, Pamela asked around, where does the money go to? What I have seen, and we have worked with UN Women, UN Women is very clear when you do work with them. They say you start with the rural areas. Um, the women that are in the urban areas um, are the last people that you're supposed to be dealing with. So um, if you look at that, it means that we, we should be able to start seeing a difference from the rural perspective. But does it make a difference in that? Probably yes, probably no. For me, colleagues, if we really want to see a difference, we necessarily as companies, and, and let's talk about the funding, um, um, uh, Prof. Um, prof, you, you, you spoke around who should be funding some of this. You have donor funders. We have companies that are spending a lot of ESG money, by the way. Um, we have government as well. We have the CEDAS. We have um, uh, IDC. We have all of these organizations. They are funding these grants that have been dished out um, to women organizations and so forth. But also what I am seeing is that sometimes this funding and ESG programs is like an internship program, unfortunately in that women will move from one area to another, number one, and then you'll find that a woman has been trained on both organizations. They will move uh, from an ESCOM to a UNISA to another organization. We should have a collaborative approach in terms of how we want to develop women so that we spend our money wisely. We don't duplicate in terms of training. We look at the resources. We can start looking at a consolidated database of the women in all the 10 economic sectors that I have shared. If we start doing that, then you will start seeing
the needle moving. And you are able to categorize the women that are self-starters, that are just starting, the women that already are in the business and the ones that are already making an impact because it's really around economic inclusion, number one, creating employment um, in the industry and participating across Africa and globally as well. So from the money perspective, my belief is that we need to start looking at how we collaborate between the industry, which is yourself as a private company or a public sector from the funding perspective, and ensuring that we run this program and we don't really have duplicating in duplication in terms of resources. That's how we can start spending all this ESD money wisely for women in the industry and based also on the opportunities that has been shared and that are already prescribed um, for in the um, in, in after as well on the protocols um, uh, on, on, on rules of origin as well because it's very very important um, and also um, I, I, and, and you know we always talk about what we should be doing as well and the challenges I, mean, I think we only spoke um, policy framework alignment how we we make decisions in the organizations, but also at the country perspective. I will use the last example so that I can pack. I'm not sure any of you um, are aware of an organization called um, Wekona, which was established from the South African perspective to accelerate women um, in visibility, in women in visibility in all the economic sectors. So um, when you have an organization like that um, and all the other organizations like She Trades, um, we connect. Um, those are the platforms where we want um, companies to be part of because you have access to the um, entrepreneurs that has been women entrepreneurs to be specific, who has been trained that has um, gone through the pro process of um, global trading, they understand how to expand the business and they how they can be part of your value chain. So colleagues, you don't necessarily even have to spend that much money. All you need to do is connect to this organization so that you provide access to opportunities to all of these organizations. If you need those organizations, please just get in touch with us. We are the enablers to the opportunities, um, colleagues, um, as procurement. We are sitting in, in, in platforms whereby it's only entrepreneurs, whilst the enablers are key. Be part of that enabling environment because that's what we want to see. It's really around making sure that we make doing business easy for women in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Lebo. Indeed, um, it's appreciated. Uh, probably for Colette, um, um, Dr. Selby um, ind is indicated that the Houghton province in South Africa has set target for provincial departments to achieve in support of women-owned enterprises. Commodities <clears throat> have been identified in ensuring targets are achieved, such as women-owned cooperative to supply linen to hospitals and small farmers to supply fruits and vegetables. Um, in line with the conversation, what is your thought around that in trying to support those um, 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 uh, women on initiative from a practical point of view? Um, thanks, Prof. I think for me, as I indicated earlier when I was doing my presentation is that already in my own environment, the intention to support um, women-owned initiatives is there. And we're moving beyond just um, supplying on the indirect side. We are supporting directly on the mainstream supply. And therefore, I would appreciate um, more and more um, women, even if they came up to, to, to Givela when we've got um, the supplier days, just so that we can understand what they have, what they provide. And not only for, 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 for us as a private sector, but I do know that, um, like the doc has said, even in the public sector, um, where I was and used to work, the, 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 the way that we would set our own targets for women-owned businesses, we would never set the target as what the business would have set. We always have stretch targets because if you set yourself a 15% target, you're gonna meet 15% and that's where you're gonna end. And yet when you stretch it, you enable the participation and you are intentional about that. What I think we lack though, in, in all sorts of businesses 
is what we call man monitoring and evaluation. And I think if we had that and the targets that we have set for you, for per annum are broken down um, per quarter and we attach a monetary value to it, we won't just give the opportunity for the sake of giving the opportunity, but the opportunity needs, needs to be linked to, um, to a value to it. And therefore meaning that even the, the teams that are tasked to do that and the businesses, there's a level of transformation and change management that is driven from the businesses across. And it's, it's, it's up to us, number one, the supply chain professionals to drive that. And number two, it's up to us as supply chain professionals to change the mindsets of the people that we are dealing with. But again, as supply chain professionals, as I indicated earlier, it's up to us to then go out there and showcase those women using these various um, forums that are there, i.e. the gender mainstreaming that in South Africa they do, or the, the women chapter or the women charter that or, um, a government normally has, or various, um, you know, on a monthly basis, on a quarterly annual basis, when our organizations um, are celebrating women, uh, women's month, we need to then have that intentional of celebrating the women that are participating into um, our organization and also that are impacting the economy at large and look for further opportunities in terms of introducing them through um, continental networks that we have and global networks that we have. Because right now, um, if we don't if we don't plan and we put it in our KPIs as, as companies and as businesses and as corporate. Earlier, I spoke about the stats. The stats for me is not good enough that we're sitting at 21.9% of women owned businesses that are participating globally. 21% globally is too little for me. So the intention, what, what the Gauteng business is doing needs to be stretched into everyone else. And we need to start showing off what we're doing so that we, it's not only on paper, but it's also practically done. Thanks, Prof. Thank you very much, Colette. Before we go to the next question from Bosco Mapunda, I see Pamela wants to chip in. Pamela? Yes, Prof. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, I fully agree with uh, Colette and also they both thanks to so, I mean, the good work that they are doing in South Africa. I think there's a, a lot to learn from. We, I mean, of course, we always see South Africa uh, to, to be playing in another league. Um, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is dubbed as something that should benefit women more. But I doubt that because if, we, if there's no preparation today uh, to prepare these women to think beyond uh, their own locality or uh, operating within their borders, the cross-border operations, logistics and customs and what comes with it, we limit them. And I'm wondering what support is really being put in place. And so what Lebo is doing with Connect down there is great. I think there's a lot for us to learn from, but otherwise that Africa continental free trade um, um, uh, argument may, may end up um, leaving the women out. So let's see what can be done, Lebo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamela. Um, from Bosco, probably Lebo, I'm not sure if you'll be want to take this, he says, um, avocado business is purely linked to quality management from farm, from the farm. How can we engage women to ensure they produce the right quality of avocado from the same land men are using? Do we need policy changes on this or training to women? How can we engage them? Thank you. Um, uh, Prof, I'm, I'm not in the agriculture space. However, I, I understand a bit of agriculture um, supply chain in terms of the work that has been um, done to develop women around that. Uh, so I, I will partly respond to that, but anyone that um, between um, Pamela... Um, yeah, if maybe if more Pamela is comfortable to come, she can come yes. after. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so um, I will tell you um, what we are doing. Firstly, um, from the skills development and so forth, um, it's one of the areas that requires support. Um, in South Africa, as an example, um, we have various features um, at the Department of Agriculture and so forth. Um, so one of the drive that is coming out of it is really to mentor and coach women um, in terms of the agriculture supply chains 
in terms of ensuring that um, when you look at agriculture in different um, areas, farming, um, livestock, and so forth, they are able to become um, part of the entire value chain into the retail sector or into FMCG. Ideally now talking to fresh produce, which must also speak to the um, agriculture side. Part of it, remember, um, in any fresh produce, it's also around soil preparation. It's, also, it's about the seeds, it's really around uh, the condition, um, you know, the temperature when you are um, really planting as well in that process. So um, from the South African perspective, and we are involved from our side as an example in teaching entrepreneurs um, around the agriculture supply chains, where to source the seeds um, as well, um, and um, in terms of the um, what you are called the funding as well that looks at the quality. So also part of what SABS is doing is really testing and really qualifying where um, the kind of quality that is needed from the um, products that are going to, to the market. Now let's talk about how you get that access of those products into the retail chains. Um, from the South African perspective, which I've seen also in other countries, most um, uh, 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 shops, for example, if you use a Woolworths um, and you use a spa or you use a shop, right, they buy from different um, farmers. Why? It's because of the quality um, of the avocados, the quality of the fruits or the fresh produce that they are getting out there. I can give an example. The fruits that I buy in one store, for an example, a Woolworths as compared to another store, some of it stays longer, some of them. So it's also around how they preserve them. It's also around the storage. It's also around the, um, the packaging. Uh, but ultimately, in terms of the quality, it really comes back to how you prepared the soil. It also comes back to um, how you are doing your agriculture um, to an extent that it can get to the value chain, um, it can get to the customer as well. So for now, I will just pack it there and Pamela can really probably just tap in there from the perspective and the value chain. Um, I want to also um, just go back. I remember when I raised my hand, uh, Prof, I wanted to tap onto what, oh, now I remember. So uh, Pamela was talking about uh, making decisions around procurement and what we should be doing from the after perspective that is just not going to help if you are not prepared. Remember colleagues that supply chain is, we're not talking about just procurement making that decision to buy. We're also talking about your end user, your engineer, the person within your value chain making a conscious decision to also train and support um, the entrepreneurs. That's the first thing. We're also talking about yourself as a logistics person um, out there being able to say that from your network redesign, um, if you want to participate and you want to start doing business in near Africa, you want to go to Zambia, you want to go to Botswana, how you redesign that network to ensure that you understand it and when you bring a woman as well into your business, you help them understand your value chain as well. So it's one element that you must remember that we're not just talking about procurement buying from um, women. We're also talking about the ESD colleagues in terms of their contribution into this process. You're also talking about your technical specialist being part of this integrate, being the stakeholders that are making this decision. Um, you're talking about um, ensuring that you reduce the risk in terms of this entire value chain because it doesn't matter what we are saying that buy from women, policies must be enabled. If we are talking about AFTA, not only from the country perspective, from the intercontinental perspective, we want it from all the countries to align in really supporting the women as well. So very important that we remember that, that the value chain analysis in terms of decision making, going up to the policy, the framework, and that being incorporated in the organizational strategies is very important for this process to be enabled. Thank you. Thank you, Lebo. If I follow up on that, I mean, follow on on that, again, based on the question that I think most Kumpunda raised about uh, avocado business, again, I should say that it's not just avocado business. Um, let me put it that perhaps countries, different countries are at different levels. South Africa is, in, is in a, at a different level. Uh, and even here in my country, Kenya, I believe that there are some parts of the country, different counties that may have made some progress with, say, uh, um, um, you know, uh, embracing agriculture and really empowering women at that level to even go into value add, you know. So where I am in my rural community here, uh, it's called Kisumu County, it's one of the beautiful cities around, but women lack a lot. One, land and land ownership is an issue. 
two is the, the poor infrastructure that affects them more. This affects every SME, but affects women most. Uh, women have no, uh, not enough resources, financial resources, as we said, or being able to even access proper transport. Uh, they rely on the public transport to transport even the most perishable and, you know, uh, delicate products to the market. Um, and some of them have had to even do unbelievable things in order for their products to leave um, perhaps the beach if it was fish to get to the market. Uh, and therefore, lack of uh, women cooperatives for, for safe transport, um, uh, challenges of, of, um, of uh, accessing the value chain. Uh, a lot of them um, end up with their products rotting, whether it is avocado, whether it is um, a, a fish. So there's just a lot that needs to be done. It's not just the quality right now. You don't talk of quality before you can talk of that capacity and capability. I've recently read two good uh, policies um, uh, or rather strategies. Uh, the government of Kenya came up with a youth uh, strategy and focusing the youth uh, on agriculture. I don't know how that has gone. I don't think I've seen any evaluation of how successful that initiative was. I think there's a new gender strategy which is looking at, again, women ec economic empowerment in agriculture, livestock, and the like. I don't know whether that is that has hit the ground, whether it's in, it's been implemented, but again, it will be cascaded to county levels. So there's so much yet to be done. I've just come back to my country early this year. And yes, I've been working in humanitarian and uh, public health, but I have so much more interest in seeing what is going on in agriculture led by the women, uh, more so because I believe that if women can be empowered, then issues around uh, access to healthcare can be addressed in the sense that they will be able to afford the medicine uh, when they can grow enough uh, nutritious food, food and fruit, they will be able to reduce um, um, uh, the typical diseases that they suffer from unnecessary. So there's just so much more to be done. I can't say there's nothing that has been done, although I haven't seen much. And so I want to be diving deeper into uh, assessing what has been done, but particularly looking at what the uh, aid organizations and United Nations have actually done at the rural level, not at the uh, national level. I'm trying to take stock of naming and counting who has done what, where, for who, what has been the result, what has been the sustainability mechanism in place so to, to reduce that dependency on those external support. I'll pause there. Thank you again. Thank you so much, um, Lebo and Pamela. Um, I see there's a hand from Lebo. Is it the historic hand or is it a new one? Historic. Um, no, 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 it's the new one. Um, for me, um, uh, you know, this, we're talking about avocado, um, Prof and colleagues. It's not just about avocado. Um, it, the question for me and, and, and for all of us, as supply chain specialists, is are we not expecting a lot? Um, at once. I mean, quality is just one area while we're talking about avocado. What about other products? What about services as well? Um, and, and when I'm talking about that, are we not expecting a lot um, immediately from women entrepreneurs to excel um, without giving them an opportunity to really learn and develop? Um, we want them to participate on the same basis for them to be um, to be successful. Let's ponder on that as supply chain professional. Let's also ponder on the fact that ESD has never um, for years been part of our supply chain structures. Um, and, and ESD is really around developing entrepreneurs. We've never been business people um, as supply chain professionals. Some of them probably, yes, I'm coming from being a procurement person into business at this point in time. It's a totally different landscape. What I'm focusing on is what I've done in the industry, which makes it easy. However, anyone that has never really fully complemented, and I can assure you that irrespective that you've been in the industry, it still does not make a difference in certain areas. So let's ponder on the fact that the skilling to upskill entrepreneurs also has gotten emphasis on us as supply chain professionals in the corporate, in the industry, to ensure that we also have business skills on how to develop other businesses. For me, it's another way of accelerating this process. We shouldn't just say that 
understanding and really uh, you know supporting women is really around triple be supplier development esd and you give it to an incubator company and you cannot manage them if they are not um, really doing some excellent work so let's start interrogate let's understanding what business is all about what is expected in really developing the women and um, what skills so that you can also now start challenging this incubation because there's too many companies that are running esd programs and the wishy-washy esd programs that are just not making a difference so for me i'm still challenging us as procurement professionals understand business be able to interrogate um, this um, this organization so that you don't just dump the money from the company for the sake of running the programs but you are also able to quantify how much of a difference you have made, how much you have taken one woman from one point into another. Then that's when now you start seeing the needle moving colleagues. Thank you, um, um, Prof um, and the colleagues. Thank you so much, Lebo, for highlighting that and for emphasizing. I think it, it reflects to the question which I'd asked uh, Pamela to say, what is it from a practical point, us as practitioners and uh, professionals, what can we do? But colleagues, I'm mindful of the time right now, uh, but I just want us to reflect on one more question from Colette, probably one minute or two, on from Patrick, that members, what is your experience in managing the local content aspect and schemes like preference and or reservation initiatives? Do you have policies for these or do you use legal frameworks only? Collect just summarize, please, and then we can move on. I'm just mindful of time. All right, uh, Prof, can you quickly just repeat the question for me? Members, what is your experience in managing the local content aspects and schemes like preference and or reservation initiatives? Do you have policies for these or do you, do you use legal frameworks only? Okay. From a South African perspective, we do have um, a policy for localization that we are currently are using. And um, a couple do that as well. There are legal frameworks to which are applicable because from a policy then to that. So we, in terms of how we do things and how we have done things in the public and the private sector, we have set aside certain commodities to which we have segregated for local content. And we work with our suppliers to achieve that. Even where I am today, we have a similar practice. However, we, we, we encourage our suppliers and the, 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 the entrepreneurs not to focus specifically to what has been designated as such, as, as such, but to also just look beyond that. Because if something has been designated for local production and local content at a certain percentage, let's say 65%, the intention is to ensure that you 100% localized, right? And we found that some of the entrepreneurs that we've worked with um, have gone beyond that. Two weeks ago, I visited a supplier as well that was localizing certain um, plastics that go into a, 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 a train door um, that are, were currently being imported and now they are localizing them. So the, the intention is really there and the work is really being done. It's quite exciting to see. I must also say that with the introduction or with the COVID in the market to date, it has actually impacted some of the suppliers. We have seen some of our suppliers dying who are localizing and we are seeing an, an, an imbalance right now with regards to what we can um, beneficiate in the country and localize and what we can do um, offshore. And it's a challenge then because then it leads to some penalties with the suppliers that we have. But the intention is to localize it best because it influences the flow of money within the economy and increases the entrepreneurship and the jobs that we try and, and support. Thanks, Prof. Thank you so much, colleagues. Um, ladies and gentlemen, like I said, we just need to be mindful of the time. I'll just go to some of the comments that are here from Ntateozi. Thank you so much to the panelists for an insightful engagement. Thanks to Ms. Yende for acknowledging the efforts by UNISA's SEM unit in modernizing SEM curriculums. We hope for continued engagement with practitioners to ensure that programs are fit for purpose for the life experiences of SEM practitioners. This event hosted by ISCA needed to be applauded as they bridge the divide between academics and the professional practice. From 
lucky through this organization's rolling up the reservation initiative have a big part to play in terms of deliberate actualization of the same and on the transparency aspects as well. From Ali Kakanka, thanks for the presentation. Kindly share the slides for a deeper, on, deeper and private reading. Thank you. Sean again had highlighted when are we going to start developing preference and reservation frameworks and policies as a region and not in our separate countries. And from OZS as well, I have been impressed with the level of support provided by Simpoint to women entrepreneurs through their strategic partnership with donors, funders, especially focusing on the enterprise supply development programs. This should be celebrated. Ms. Lesualo, you, are you able to reflect on the success of and all experiences delivering these products? From Freddie, interesting and valuable presentations. Thank you all. And from Lo Mojello, Lebo, I agree with you 100%. Indeed, empowering someone needs to come with express for the appreciations. Thanks, panelists. This was a powerful insightful discussion and from Sean thank you Prof and your associate for putting this together thank you sincerely to the panel members and to all of you colleagues it has been a wonderful um, game changer series um, the discussions were insightful we cannot complete or answer all the questions as of now because of time but we believe that through this networking engagement empowering sessions would be able to engage one another. If you have any burning questions that you feel needs to be answered or you want to be empowered on, please you can email um, the panelists directly or you can write to the ISCA secretariat team uh, to um, link you up on that. Colleagues, we've come to the end of the session. I want to thank um, the ISCA team for the opportunity and also thank our host for this program. Um, who was not able to um, be here to do it, but I was glad that she was able to join us sometime in the program. I'm talking about Dr. Yandan Teta. Colleagues, our next Game Changer series will be on the 27th of September, 2022, and it's a session that you can afford to miss. Reason being that we're going to have an international perspective on public procurement from the Netherlands and uh, what lessons can we draw from them um, and getting a proper understanding of their procurement system? I want to thank you on this, but probably before we leave, if our panelists are there, just to get 30 seconds, please don't exceed 30 seconds, your last message to the panelists, to the uh, team before we go. I'll start with Lebo, followed by Pamela and then Colette. Thank you. 30 seconds, please. Uh, Prof, thank you. Um, from my side, so let's, let's always remember that supply chain um, is an enabler. Uh, it is a foundation for everything that happens in the industry in terms of revenue, profitability, economic development, um, and so forth. So let's make sure that we have a conscious effort um, and become intentional around um, strategically positioning um, Africa. Um, let's um, reposition Africa through our procurement practices we are on the way of really beneficiating in terms of our resources. So all of us in Africa, let us partner towards um, ensuring that we support the Africa that we want. It's all about supply chain. It's all about women. Let's not forget that women are the levers. We cannot afford um, to operate without women. Women are the foundation in everything that we are doing. Wise decisions, they come with a different flavor in business as well. Thank you, Prof, and thank you, colleagues, for being part of this discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Pamela. Thank you so much, and uh, Lebo has said it all. I think for me, it's one message. Procurement practitioners have a key part to play. Remember, you're the ones who assess these suppliers when they come in front of you, ask yourself, are you doing enough? to give an equal opportunity, a level playing field to women, to those living with disability, to, you know, to the youth, 
I think perhaps it's time that you have policies in place that uh, set aside a percentage of your procurement to go to the respective people because you can do your part. I spoke from the donor angle, from the aid organization angle, who avail the financial resources for those who are implementing uh, aid programs. But as private sector people who are using your own company resources, and mind you, over 50% goes into procurement. If you can just set aside a percentage that you say this is set aside for um, women, uh, youth, and people living with disability, to make sure that they also play a critical part in the community because disability is not an ability, but also that women can. So thank you so much for all of you. Really great to be part of this wonderful uh, media in South Africa group. And at the end of the day, we are all Africans and uh, we should also assume that the borders don't exist because the continental free trade agreement is going to be a game changer. And it's for us, not just from the procurement angle, but also the knowledge transfer. What can you do to be able to transfer that knowledge to whoever comes and sits in front of you to help them really understand what is the tender and how do they participate? How do you make it easy for them and take it as a development initiative? You one day want to look back and say, when I was working there, I empowered this, 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 and you know, so and so person. And today you can see them being part of the value chain. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Pamela. Um, Colette? In conclusion, uh, Prof, I think we ought to be forward looking, take the lessons from the past. Let's measure our non-performance and create it into serious performances. Let's break the boundaries um, and, and, and let's share the lessons to create best practices. Um, because if we don't share those lessons to create best practices, we're gonna sit in the same area going around in circles and repeating the same thing. So thank you to, for me to my um, fellow um, speakers and panelists have learned a lot from the two of you. And I think I look forward to further engaging. Uh, what's important is that, yes, we are one continent. We all are Africans and women are the core um, in our country um, and in, 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 in the global world. So let's continue to work together in developing all these businesses um, to strengthen all our economies. Thank you, Prof. Thank you so much. The LPC thought leading team. Thank you very much, colleagues. See you all on the 27th September 2022. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.